Horse in chess, home city reaction. This is Russian forces attempt to retake Kursk. Watch on task and purpose. Yes, latest task and purpose video, and it's about Russian forces attempt to retake Kursk. Now, I've been watching uh, this Kursk uh, invasion videos from like different channels, like Enforcer, like up to date thing. Uh, that stopped because obviously, like, things became slowed down or something. I remember, like, I was constantly saying, oh, maybe this is the time where we'll hear about Russian forces. This is the time we'll hear about Russian forces. And it was never there. Which kind of surprised me, like, okay, why is Russia not trying to take back their own state or their own city, right? Uh, what is it called? Oblast, right? Why are they not trying to take back their own oblast? Like, isn't this like a slap in the face the more they delay? And I'm like, maybe they're trying to do something else in Ukraine. And they realize uh, some strategy, like they're trying to ease up from South Ukraine. And that's why they attack Kursk, so Russian forces can, like, focus on Kursk, so there is less pressure at Donbass and things like that. Maybe they realized that. And that was something like that, right? Uh, where Russia was, like, uh, amping up, uh, you know, like, progression uh, at, uh, you know, uh, basically southern Ukraine. I saw the Kings and General video on it. So it was, like, mixed, like, what is happening there? But I guess they are finally trying to take back Kursk, I guess. We'll see how their attempt go. And it says attempt, so I guess that it didn't succeed or they are underway right now, who knows. So this is going to be interesting to see like how this is working, right? Uh, but because if they can't take curse back and they've suffered losses, like, yeah, I, I don't know how you're going to interpret that. Like, uh, you know, if like Russia first invaded Ukraine, now Russia themselves are getting invaded. And by the way, they can't even defend anymore. Like that would be a big slap in the face. But yeah, let's, wait. let's see what this one, I guess. It task number is a great channel. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, from different sources, he gives out information. So it's not like it's his take or like his opinion type of way. Even though opinions are always going to be there because that's how videos go. There's nothing going to be 100% unbiased unless somebody literally just reads you facts, right? Unless somebody does that, like there's nothing's going to be unbiased. But this is like really good channel to get, you know, ongoing information like this. So yeah, that's always one. Russian forces have started their counterattack inside the Kursk region with the goal of pushing all of Ukraine's troops out. I want to examine two main things in this episode. First, the results of this offensive campaign so far. Then, the impact of new foreign aid flowing into both Ukraine and Russia right now. Starting with the battle in Kursk, beginning on September 10th, 2024, we observe Russia launching their attack. Two days later, the Russian Ministry of Defense had reported that they'd recaptured at least 10 settlements. In that initial push alone, they recaptured roughly 20% of the territory back. Russia is now advancing in Russia. The main effort to pay attention to here, I think, is on the western flank of the Ukrainian-held territory, and the key town that you need to know about here is Korenova because it sits right on the edge of the same river. There's a very important reason why Russia aimed at recapturing Korenova. This is because retaking this bit of land was strategically important for their follow-on operations. This push was designed to clear- That is the same place that's like bordered by a river, right? Where there's only two, three bridges there, which was destroyed by Ukraine. And they were creating this kind of like a, you know, makeshift bridges just to like transport troops, you know, like this wooden bridges or something. They were destroying that as well. So it's very interesting what happened there. Clear a land route for their soldiers who were previously trapped between the Ukrainian Kursk element and south of the same river. By opening up that route, Russian troops mitigated the effect of Ukrainian strikes on bridges over the same river. This lessened the impact and avoided them being encircled. Logistically, this also helps Russia's future follow-on operations because it will allow them to resupply their forces south of the river more easily now. Previously, for the past two months, they'd relied on temporary pontoon bridges that were a target for Ukrainian long-range strikes. As this counterattack really starts to shape up, it appears like so far Russian troops, their strength has grown in Kursk from 11,000 prior to the incursion to an estimated roughly 35 to 38,000 Russian soldiers now, to the point of numbers because we all love numbers, especially if you have the same kind of tism as me. Russian Major General Apti Aladonyov, an informal spokesperson for the Kremlin military with 300,000 followers on Telegram, said that Ukraine had deployed 12,000 soldiers and 400 military vehicles to Kursk, although those are just estimates, and I've seen the Russian Ministry of Defense claim that they have eliminated 19,000 
Ukrainian soldiers, which would suggest there's 40,000 there. Uh, it, the numbers are difficult to pin down. By September 16th, 2024, Russia continued to advance further and appeared to have retaken about 30% of the territory in the Kursk incursion, or contested it at least. Estimates claim Ukrainian-held territory had been reduced by from 1,250 kilometers down to 900 kilometers. Roughly 80 towns are still held by Ukraine currently as of the recording of this video. But after two months of fierce fighting here, Ukraine is still attempting to hold on to the territory. If this feels like whiplash because territory is changing hands quickly, you're not alone. This often happens in war. Just look at the yo-yo front line oh during the Korean <laughs> Come on, but this is an outlier. This is rare, this Korean war thing. Left, up and down, up and down. It's ridiculous, right? When I first realized this, I just like couldn't believe it. Like this is even real. But yeah, the pushback all the way to like a very small point at South Korea, then then American forces and like uh, Korean forces basically pushed all the way back, all the way to China, back and forth, back and forth. They fucked up, they went too close to China, and there you go. Rather than retreating, they didn't. I learned that from Fatrishan. Uh, rather than retreating, they didn't, right? And they fucked up basically. China got involved or something like that. But yeah. When it comes to Russian force, like instead of 1200 kilometers, now they hold 900 kilometers, which is like, okay, that's somewhat for example, still 900 kilometers and all those towns is still a big number. So Ukraine is still holding a large portion of uh, whatever they captured, which is interesting. Korean War, which saw thousands of kilometers of land change hands in a few short years until they ended up close to where they started. To that point, between October 6th and October 7th, Ukrainian forces had their first reports of stopping this Russian advance by halting them and moving forward on the western side of the salient once more, where they had been losing land. This was only a few kilometers they recaptured that we're talking about here south of Korinevo. You can draw whatever conclusion you would like from this development at this point. It's really just wild speculation. All I can really confidently tell you right now is that this land that we're observing here is being contested. Attacks and counterattacks can reverse the course and momentum of war quickly, and I think it's just really a testament to how unpredictable war is. If you're commenting right now that I'm biased, I would agree with you. I think anyone who's passionate about a subject or cares about a particular topic is going to have some kind of bias. What I try to do is present the information for you in an objective way. Look, bias, <laughs> any, any opinion is bias, right? The only way to not be biased is literally read facts and like headlines. I say, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. I don't know, like figure shit out for yourself and then close the video. If you want to give anything based on the facts you know, that's going to be an opinion and that will be biased. That is what bias means. But how biased? That's usually the problem, right? So that's what people should do. I see people commenting on basically every video like, oh, this is biased, this is biased. Yeah, but how much biased? That's what you should look for. Way, the best that I can, put my cards out on the table and tell you what my intentions are, and I try to show you my work. I can understand why people like to watch the how Ukraine is smashing Russia or how Russia is annihilating Ukraine content, but the truth is far more complicated than that right now. To find out more of the truth, France 24 journalist Catherine Norris Trent and her crew, who are either brave as heck or crazy, went on the ground inside Kursk in order to report what was happening in this part of the front that is largely covered in a fog of war. I don't mention on here often enough how much respect I have for war correspondents who put their lives in harm's way, especially the ones who try to bring us unfiltered, not sugar-coated information. Their hard work and observations is what helps us all make some kind of sense out of what's actually happening on the ground. Ukrainian officers told Trent that 2,000 Russian civilians remain in the areas that they control. Now, Ukrainian troops are now responsible for providing food, and many of these people are without electrical power. Trent spoke with a representative from the Ukrainian. Yeah, but uh, this was the issue before even the war started. Like Ukraine and Russia, the borders are blurred a lot of times. A lot of Russians and Russian relatives live in Ukraine. Same thing with Ukrainians and Ukraine relatives who are in Ru Russia. So it's like sometimes it can be blurred lines like who's who and who's what. So I don't think, uh, you know, Russians being that is going to be a problem. Like they're still going to provide food and things like, you know, they're going to realize like this is like, uh, you know, battle between Kremlin and Ukraine, not really people, because people might as well be like, oh, by the way, my relative lives there. That is, that's Ukraine, basically. So like borders get blurred sometime. Ukrainian military who said that the artillery shelling and drone strikes against them in Kursk have increased substantially recently. 
We've seen that Ukrainian troops are now making use of Russian defensive positions, trenches and fortifications that they had initially cleared out, some of which were designed to have 360 degree protection. But one of the most revealing things that I've seen is changes in the way that the Russian troops are using different tactics in this specific counterattack. It appears to be different than usual. A Russian military blogger said that they were deploying a battalion tactical group or BTG for their offensive operations in the Kursk Oblast. Now, BTGs were the standard scale of battle for Russia training and doctrine from the past. Russian forces have not operated in a battalion-sized formation like this since earlier in the war, way back in mid-2022, according to a United Kingdom intelligence report. With BTGs, we're talking about a huge force of like 800 soldiers with dozens of armored vehicles coordinating and moving at the same time. The reason both sides mainly attack in smaller platoon sized elements or even two man buddy teams now is because this avoids hitting an ambush and getting your whole battalion held up. Platoons are a smaller sized target for artillery, but they also carry less capabilities on the downside. So the Institute for the Study of War reported that they observed Russian troops operating in company sized units of about 100 soldiers and eight vehicles at a time, which is still larger than what we normally see. We see here video evidence of eight Russian armored vehicles assaulting at the same time. The tactic that they appear to deploy is one of the platoons goes off road into the field to its right and then they start laying down suppressive fire from the field while the other platoon continues advancing along the more vulnerable open exposed road. The Hawk Tua girl made an interesting point about this on her podcast, Talk Tua, where she said that the re-implementation of battalion tactical groups within Russian military operations underscores a fundamental dialect. I was actually, actually thought that she's going to say something. No way she said that. Within Russian military praxis. And this is just her opinion, and I'm not sure if I agree with it or not. But she believes by readopting these formations, Russia opens themselves up to exposure to attritional vulnerabilities within postmodern warfare. No, she said literally none of that. I'm just making sure you're still paying attention. This increased scale of fighting inside Kursk could be explained by the fact that Russian command and control inside Russian territory is more easy to run. This allows them to better coordinate larger mechanized assaults compared to when they're deep inside Ukrainian territory with their supply lines and ground lines of communication stretched. A quick note, if you're commenting pro-Russian comments right now, I actually don't dismiss you as or wave you away as just some kind of Russian bot. I can, in fact, imagine a world where people genuinely hold different opinions and don't need to be paid off to hold. What does, again, like, I don't understand that, right? I, I see that all Russian bot, like, have you ever thought of maybe that's some Russian guy who feels like that, who's pro-Russian? Why does it have to be a bot? <laughs> I even see some shorts and things like, oh, look at that our AI bot made this video, like, I'm not saying something like that can't exist, but like, I mean, come on, why do you always choose extremes? And it's just like, that's the case. Oh, by the way, that's a bot. That's an AI. That's like, people can be different like that as well. That can be people. Doesn't have to be a bot. I'm not saying there are no bots. Obviously, there's bots. But YouTube is getting better at like capturing bot, right? Even in my videos, like, I used to get a lot of like weird type of like bot style comments. Nowadays, basically none of them exist because YouTube like probably clamped down on them or something, right? So not everyone's a bot. People can have different opinions those opinions. Instead, I try to engage with everyone who attempts to do so in good faith at least. So what we're observing here so far is that in the first two days, Russia made a sweeping push and since then over the past two weeks, there has been a slower pace of advance. By September 20th, Russian forces recaptured more territory in the western part of Kursk, reaching to the village of Darino. In the following week, the territory remained about the same, with Russia having recaptured roughly 35 to at least 40% of the territory in Kursk, mainly from the western flank, as of recording. The northeast of the incursion, and near the largest town of Suja there, hasn't had much movement, although reports show Russian forces are starting to push towards that town slowly. The momentum appears to be back in Russia's favor inside the Kursk incursion. And that's why everyone wants to know one simple question, can Russia ultimately achieve the goal of pushing Ukrainian troops out? 
Trying to figure that out by quantifying troop numbers and ratios of attrition can be a useful... Yeah, I think Russia can do that if Russia really wanted to like focus like that. But now it's all based on like a war table, battleground tactics and shit. If you do it like that, like you're compromising in other places, which might, which what might Ukrainians want in the first place, right? Like taking troops out of Donbass and southern Ukraine and like, if not taking out, like lessening the intensity of it. Uh, not sending too many reinforcement because now that's going to curse. Maybe put more like, uh, you know, conscriptions out there, pissing off people in Russia. Like everything's very delicate. If Russia really wanted to like, focus on cost, like, like, fuck it, let's just take it back. They can do that, right? But what else are they going to compromise, right? That's the thing. Method, although all methods of trying to predict future war outcomes are seriously flawed in one way or another, this New York Times article spoke to the U.S. intelligence officers who estimated that Russia would need 50,000 soldiers here to accomplish that goal. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian government said that they believe Russia was ultimately trying to assemble 70,000 here eventually. Is it just me or is this Dunkin' Coffee not doing it anymore? I need something harder. Ow. These are, of course, just estimates. During pre-workout, I guess that's what I do. There you go. <laughs> Very high intensity of caffeine. No, seriously, don't do that. That's not good. I mean, it's not going to hurt you anything, but that's not good. There's other stimulants in that, which is not good for you. And factors can always change, but it indicates to us that unless Ukraine dedicates more soldiers, this outcome could occur. Personally, I looked at the casualty estimates for both sides and feel that getting accurate casualty numbers at this point is really not reliable figures from either side, so it's tough to say. It will also make a big difference, ultimately, how many of the counterattacking units are special forces versus border guards or conscripts. As we dive deeper into this situation, it's clear that the United States' involvement overseas isn't just about military presence. We need to navigate supporting allies and threats from regional adversaries. Take the escalating conflict between Israel and Lebanon, for example. The United States is sending more troops to the region out of quote-unquote an abundance of caution. Ground News found more than 200 sources... U.S. is sending more troops to the Middle East as violent rises, so as... Uh... In Jordan, right, there is already a sta U.S. station there, uh, where U.S. troops and Marines are there, if I remember correctly, uh, between Israel and Iran, I think. So I guess they're reinforcing that if it becomes too much and if U.S. have to join the war type of way. And I think U.S. can join the war there without, like, you know, worrying the same level they're worrying about, like, Russia-Ukraine thing. U.S. can't join Russia-Ukraine thing because it's Russia. Is different. Well, against Iran or something or Middle Eastern conflict, they can just like, yeah, uh, US has been in Middle East for like a long time, just like Russia and other countries have been. Middle East is where everybody goes to their testing weapon or whatever the fuck that is. There are small wars here and there all the time. So if like things go out, go out of hand, the US do have to join it, I guess they can. So I guess that's why they're sending troops there. Like they've warned Iran not to launch missiles and they still did it. Right, so who knows what's gonna happen next? Like US would warn, like you definitely don't do that, and they still do it. <laughs> First, third time's the char charm. If that doesn't happen, I guess they might have to join. There you go. Covering this, but reactions to this decision vary widely. Al Jazeera, based in Qatar, seems to blame any potential war on the United States' inability to stop what's happening in Gaza. Meanwhile, the Jewish news syndicate coming out of Israel sees this move as a precaution for the region's escalating conflict. Without any easy access to diverse perspectives closer to the conflict, you'd have a partial understanding of a very complicated issue. That's why I continue to partner with Ground News. Yeah, basically, like... There's a good on side, like, why didn't you join the war? You could have stopped the war and, like, could have been much easier that way. So Biden is at a fault. There's going to be another side, is like, I'm glad Biden didn't do anything. We don't need to escalate. So both things will say opposite and maybe both are true, the fuck knows, right? But there you go, you're going to have both sides of things. Left wing, right wing, both sides. Their app and website simplify all the research needed to deeply understand global conflicts by aggregating stories from thousands of local and international outlets. I think Ground News is on an important mission to fix what's broken in today's news. So head over to ground.news task or scan my QR code to save 40% on their Vantage plan. Unlimited access to neutral, balanced, and global insights comes to just $5 a month. Ukrainian forces have made several claims of halting Russian advances in Kursk, but so far it appears like Russian troops have continued to push forward. 
According to RBC Ukraine, which is a Ukrainian news agency, they claim to have information that the Kremlin had ordered Russian troops to push Ukrainian forces out of Kursk by the timeline of October 15th, and then they plan to create a buffer zone inside Sumy region inside Ukraine by October 30th. Whether that timeline is realistic or not, it gives us an indication of the Russian goals, what they may be up to here. Meanwhile, at the same time, it's 10 October right now. Let's say Tarsan Bros made this video a few days ago when he recorded this. Really, in seven days, you're gonna take back like whatever nine, you know, whatever you know that. How many that was left? Like only 25 percent or something they took. So other remaining 70, 75 percent, you're gonna take that in like six, seven days. Come on, that's like way too overblown. No way that's gonna happen. Um, we've seen Ukrainian forces attempt to strike into new locations in the Kursk region in at least three separate spots they have broken over the border. So far, none of these incursions have gained major territory so far. They have advanced a few kilometers into Russia in those spots. One's noted as being 11 square kilometers. The other main push to note here that's kind of important to know about is in the Glushkovsky Raon. Am I saying that right? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. This is located about 20 kilometers directly to the west of the original incursion. It's about 43 square kilometers total in territory that they have contested here. Some analysts speculated that it might have been an attempt to link up with the original incursion, which has so far not materialized. At this point, it appears to be too early to tell what the broader effects of the Kursk operation will be. We don't know if history will judge it as a failure or a success. We don't know if any intangible psychological effects it might have. Critics of the operation have pointed out that it has come at a cost and has left yeah, other parts of the front of the line, line more vulnerable. vulnerable. They've also stated it could all be for naught if Ukraine, Ukraine is, is unable, unable to hold. To... Yeah, I don't... <sighs> what, what does that mean, failure? It's a war. N shit that doesn't matter anymore happens all the time in wars, just for that particular moment, right? So like in hindsight, this might materialize into nothing. Like, what was the point of Kursk? But when the Kursk offensive happened, that period mattered. Maybe it was a time to show, like, American and Western countries, see, Ukraine war is not lost. We need more of your support. And that was success. Maybe it was something to, like, ease the pressure from southern Ukraine, where now they're sending 50,000, 70,000 troops, Russians are sending that in Kursk. They would have sent it in, like, southern Ukraine. Yeah, but in hindsight, in future, when the war is done and everything's done, like, what was the point? Of course, you know, in Kurzon, it just lasted a few times and then didn't Russians take it back? That's not how anything works. It's like saying that what was the point of, like, Korean War going back and forth, back and forth? In war, you throw anything at you, you can throw at it, trying to win it, right? In the end, that's how it works. Like, most wars, when you really look at it, what was the point of that? That's how most wars are. There's a reason people say wars are pointless in the end. Because what was the point of any war? any of the territory. By October 1st, 2024, news had hit that in the south region that Volodar city had fallen. Ukrainian troops withdrew to avoid encirclement after defending the town for two and a half years against assaults. These are just some of my thoughts, though. You might have a different perspective. Something that I think is connected to all of this, though, that I think is really important aspect is that Ukraine's President Zelensky has been attempting to secure additional support for what he has called his quote unquote victory plan. Zelensky traveled to the United States and all over the world, really, as he attempted to sell his victory plan to politicians. Essentially, the broad strokes of the plan, as I could understand it, is that Ukraine wants to end the war from a position of strength. He says he's unwilling to accept a deal that would allow Russia to regroup and restart the war from an even stronger position in the future. This means he's looking for those security guarantees from NATO or other countries. But one of the main... That is the thing, that's the most fucked up thing about this war. If Ukrainians didn't fight back and somehow Russians took over a lot of Ukraine and they had to like make some kind of like a deal or something, it would have made sense and Ukraine would have made a deal and it would have been fucked up for the Ukrainians, but the war would have ended. But now, after everything Ukrainians have been through, after so many people have died, after so many cities been destroyed, after this long time where Ukraine was under attack, how is Ukraine going to accept anything that is like less than what you think? Like they have to end up at higher ground, right? They have to have better deal in the end. The, what is the stop? Like people will be like, why didn't you stop the war earlier if you're going to do this type of way? Russia can end war below anything like without having upper hand because they're like, we are Russia. 
we were seen as the second or top two most power in the world for decades now since the Soviet Union. USA versus Russia, that's always been the case. Right? Even today with all their gas uh, deposits and like oil and their like, you know, um, nuclear powers and everything, even after everything that had happened, they're still flexing like, oh, we are Russia. If Russia ends the war in a treaty with, you know, a lower hand, like giving more to Ukrainians than what they can get, that's slap in the face of Russia, like, why did you do that war? So both needs to have upper hand, but that's not how things work. You can't have upper hand in both sides. This is the fucked up thing about it. Like, how is this war going to come, come to end? How is this war going to end at the table? Like, I don't see that happening. That's the fucked up part. It's like, it, it, it has progressed so far. Like, how is it going to end? This is just fucked up. Main things he was trying to secure on the tactical level is approval to launch attack of missiles inside Russia. This is really important for him because it could make it a lot easier for his soldiers to hold on to the Kursk territory inside Russia and then ultimately eventually use it as a bargaining chip in peace negotiations. If he doesn't get that permission, the likelihood of completely losing the Kursk region, while not certain, does increase. That's just my read on a very subjective situation. I fully admit I could be wrong. And this goes two ways, because Moscow has also been working with its foreign allies to secure additional support for their war effort as well. Putin has made many trips to secure support. Everyone is going to visit their friends and ask for a little bit of help. We all do it from time to time, right? Because on September 5th, 2024, Reuters released this article reporting that Russia had a secret war drone project inside China. This is according to material that they reviewed from a European intelligence agency. The evidence is two invoices between the companies and several reports on the progress of the manufacturing directly to Russia's Ministry of Defense. The factory was supposedly opened on behalf of Imez Kupos, which is a subsidiary company of a state-owned Russian weapons company, where they produce a wide variety of vehicles and weapon systems for the Russian military, including one-way attack drones. But what brought this to the attention of the... That's the thing, right? Uh, when it comes to like uh, Russia and China, they share the border, right? Uh, they can just basically have some secretly do things between each other without anybody knowing it and supply each other. And China is a powerhouse. Saying China is a powerhouse feels like an understatement in modern world, right? Because for decades, like USA was like flying way too high, like literally in the clouds with their every resources, their capitalism mentality, business strategies, their, you know, GDP and thing. China is the only country, you know, in the like past century or so has been able to come close to USA, even though it's a half the economy of USA, but still that's way too close, right? Uh, so China is a power, especially when it comes to like making shit, China and its rare earth material and everything. China can just like do its own thing. If China had to create some kind of like iron curtain thing, with them like how russia did uh, you know soviet union did right china would be a very unique country who would be able to pull it off because so much shit they already have with them that they can just do that they can make shit themselves and just do that right and uh, right now they, they are like rich enough and they have enough resources enough like they can really uh, sustain a lot of things right when you hear about oh wait a minute china made a full hospital in just seven days you're like yeah makes sense it's china so China can really supply Russia and logistic, logistically it would be like really instrumental without anybody even knowing it, like slowly supplying through rail or something, whatever, before anybody can realize it. The world international news is that Reuters claims the firm works with a Chinese company called Replius TSK Vector Industrial. The big question, of course, is whether or not the Chinese government was aware of what was happening here or if this was just civilian companies working with the Russian military to try to make a quick buck. To that point, come on, really? Are we uh, some Chinese civilian company working with Russian government without Chinese government knowing it? I'm pretty sure they would realize they might get disappeared if they don't notify Chinese government. Come on. Reuters, Reuters points out that there's no official evidence that the Chinese government knew about what was happening. Chinese government, of course, tries to paint themselves as a neutral arbiter in this conflict, but people are looking for signs of China supporting Russia. Now, we can, of course, speculate until we're red in the face about this, but that's all it would be at this point is speculation. One thing to look for would be whether or not the Chinese government cracks down on this. See, this is what the problem is. People are looking for the connection. Which people? 
I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be like uh, U.S. and like governments like that. Like every five wise government, right? Like England and U.K. and like France and all of them. Why? Because they all rely on China for economy, right? This is why I'll, I even get a lot of comments like US and China will never be at war because they both rely on each other. Okay, that that is kind of like slightly lesser true today than it was a few years ago, but it's still really true, right? So even US is like, okay, even if we get the information, then we have to respond. If we respond in any way, we shoot ourselves on the leg because we kind of need China. China also need US. So even if they have like some information, they'll be like, oh, let's, let's, let's just keep it a bit away. Not deliberately, but you know, like, uh, I don't know how else to say that. Like if there is no direct connection, let's just keep it that way type of way. This kind of thing. Or if we see more of the Russian government working inside China to develop weapons and drones, that would reveal more on that front. The type of munitions they're creating is the new long range attack drone, the Gryapa 3 with a range of about 2,500 kilometers, max takeoff weight of 300 kilograms, which means- Garpia, I think that's how you say it, right? R and P's together, I don't know. Means you could reach West Germany from Russia, but its payload is about 50 kilograms of explosives. For reference, that's slightly more than the 45 kilograms that you find in like a NATO 155 howitzer shell. This new Chinese version introduced key upgrades like its engine, but in the past, assembly remained inside Russia so that's really what's to note here. The reason this is something of interest is because when the invasion started in 2022, China tried to position itself as a neutral intermediary between Ukraine and Russia. But since then, Bloomberg reported that China was providing Russia with critical satellite imagery, microelectronics, machine tools to build tanks, and various technologies essential for weapons production. Critical- You surprised, I mean, come on. They just like their interest kind of align if you really that's why i was saying like iran china russia kind of like creating some form of access like it was a case in world war one right for the war effort yes but lethal aid no meanwhile components from russia's drones and missiles include pieces from america and european countries as well which is part of the reason why some believe the chinese government are not aware or at least not encouraging this but speaking of foreign aid, which I know isn't really as sexy of a topic as tactics and explosions, but it's important. So stay with me here, brother. We're almost at the end. How effective has renewed United States aid and military assistance been this year? So Ukraine just got a $60 billion package. Much of that money is reinvested back into the United States defense industry, creating American jobs, jobs which, which you might. Yeah, how, how, <laughs> how important U.S. aid have been. I've seen uh, even richer, uh, you know, like economies in Europe giving like few billion aid here and there in the US is like 80 billion, 90 billion, just like billions are just going all like money, numbers doesn't matter, just go high. Like, yeah, US aid is instrumental. Without US's aid, Ukraine wouldn't have hold out this long. That's for damn sure. So that's one of the most in instrumental thing for Ukraine. Might think is good or bad, depending on how you feel about the military industrial complex. Personally, I feel like a lot of foreign aid spending bills are similar to health insurance bills we have in America. They suck to pay them, but if you don't, you might regret it someday down the road. But what actual impact has it had on the ground? Is there any way to quantify? <laughs> that is so true. What he said is so true. The same thing, I just realized, like, uh, I think Sandbox video, right? Well, U.S. strategy is like basically creating shit so powerful that it works as a deterrent, like F-22 and things, where it was never used. And people are like, look at that, you wasted money in F-22s. Not wasted. If anything, that's one of the most well-spent thing, if it means no war, right? No battle. U.S. is walking around untouchable because of those things. So if you just see that as like a failure, you just see like, oh, wait a minute, you did no war. What's the point of this? Yeah, because of that, you didn't, did no war, right? So shit like that, like people always like analyze it on like on the surface of it and it's like you're wasting money. Really? Like did you analyze it in detail? Like geopolitics and everything? I it. In 2023, we saw a delay of about six months of military aid. During that period, we saw Ukraine's front line start to deteriorate. It's also true that the Russian military made effective changes during this time period as well. When analyzing something as complicated as war, where there's literally thousands of variables that go into the equation, it's difficult to point to one thing and say that's why this happened. But Russia may have continued their advance with or without the Western aid sent to Ukraine. 
One of the easiest dumbed down ways to quantify it though is by looking at ratios of artillery fire and air defense. Russian forces normally had like a 5 to 1, 10 to 1 artillery advantage, but that's been up to 12 to 1 at one point in many sectors. The second ratio was air defense intercepts. Ukraine normally intercepted between 80 to 60% of incoming missiles, cruise missiles. That number has gone down to 30 to 20% at worst. Once aid was renewed, experts cautioned that it would take some time before the difference was felt. That is a massive difference of intercepts. What the fuck happened there, man? <laughs> it is like 80% is like you, you basically, you know, throw everything away, right? 80% is big. 20, 30% is like opposite of that. Like, again, it's 20% basis, like 80% got through. Like, what the fuck? Help. The shipment had already been pre-positioned in Eastern Europe, waiting for approval. Air defense was made up of aircraft AIM-9 missiles and Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. It's interesting to note the Pentagon no longer gives exact numbers on armored vehicles that they've sent to Ukraine now. Prior to this, they said it was 200 M2 Bradleys. That <laughs> Why would they give numbers? Just to give Russians, oh, by the way, this is how many we send, so look for it. Is that it? Of course, they're not going to give you numbers. They sent, but we see it's been updated now to more than 300. Similarly, the M113 APCs increased from 300 to over 400. So we can assume this package means that at the very least, the U.S. sent an additional 100 M2 Bradleys and 100 M113s. And the package also included MRAPs and Humvees, which we saw were used in the Kursk assault. Munitions of all varieties were sent from 50 caliber to 155 artillery. Okay, there are missiles and the stingers, uh, smaller round, small arms and additional rounds of small arm ammunition, including 50 caliber. That's small. I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. Additional ammunition, uh, artillery shell, mortal shell. Damn. Oh. Munitions of all varieties were sent from 50 caliber to 155 artillery. Additional tube launch, optically tr tracked, wire guided tow missiles. I guess that's for Bradley's. Javelins and 84s. Anti armor mines, <laughs> claymores. Like, okay. High Mars rocket pods were delivered. Tactical support logistics vehicles were added to help coordinate the lethal aid. That first shipment had a value of $1 billion which isn't to say it cost $1 billion exactly, but that it was appraised at that value. Most of these weapons were outdated old stockpiles that the United States wasn't going to use and is now replacing. Part of the package is $13 billion bucks set aside to replace anything in U.S. inventory that is sent to Ukraine. Originally, the Pentagon accountants were overestimating the value of the weapons sent because they were Did pricing them at- Wait a minute, wait a minute, so let me get this straight. U.S. had a lot, lot of old shit. That they couldn't just replace because now they have to justify that to their own people. But now they can send this as aid and they're just like replace the cool shit with it. So they can help Ukraine in the process. Right, so they, <laughs> they, can, they can help Ukraine in the process but also like replace it with the modern shit. It's just like win-win type of situation. Is that what's happening? I mean, when I think about it, it kind of makes sense. But yeah, I mean, obvi you know, obviously, you, you know, like uh, this is the aid packages, right? So like American people are paying for it. But it was already there, right? And they couldn't replace it because now it's been more money. Congress would have pissed off. People would have been pissed off. The, you know, like people would be afraid of losing their seats in Senate and whatever. But now they can replace it. Oh, by the way, we sent it to Ukraine. What do you want us to do? Not replace it? There you go. Brand new values instead of depreciated values. It's like if you go to sell your car and you say, it's still worth what it was when I bought it. Not true. This freed up additional funds. The second $400 million package took a month because it requires a fleet of planes, trains, and trucks to arrive at NATO depots in Europe, ultimately destined for Poland, like Amazon Prime delivery, but for weapon systems. Many of these vehicles, I think- Don't give him an idea, man. Bezos would go like, wait a minute, why are we not doing it? Amazon delivery service for arms. Were then man. used and put to use in the Kursk assault. Some critics of these packages have questioned what their ultimate goal is and where will it all lead. By August, it became more clear what Ukraine had done with much of this renewed aid. They had used it to launch an attack in Kursk, I think. You could disagree, though. Air defense intercept rates have improved to 80% of drones, 70% of cruise missiles being intercepted. 
And that, I think, is the important key takeaway here, that these packages have bought Ukraine time. They're not going to necessarily change the course of the war, but they help Ukraine buy more time. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching. Follow me at Cappy. Yeah. This is the effed up part about it. Every time you hear about anything about Ukraine and people always say like, this bought them time, this bought that time. Nobody really analyzes, say like, this is going to give them ads to win the war. Nobody ever says that. Like, that makes me think like, hmm. And when it comes to Russia, oh, by the way, they're under wartime economy now. Oh, by the way, they're taking things from Iran. They're taking this from North Korea. They're amping up their artillery shells. It's still not looking like Ukraine's going to win anytime soon, is it? And Russia has been like losing in that favor for how long? That's the picture you always get. It doesn't matter what happened, which is kind of like, okay. But yeah, <sighs> Russian forces attempt to retake Kurs, so I guess it's underway. They're targeting for 15 October. I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, yeah, soon maybe. So, and even if like Ukrainians get pushed back all the way back to Ukraine and Kurs gets retaken by Russia, people will ask the question like, what was that for? I don't know, to get more aid, convince people like Ukraine is still worth giving aid to type of way, like war is not lost, right? And like, you know, like how 20, 30% was the intercept, now it's back to 70, 80%. So like aid didn't matter, right? So yeah, it's all interesting. All right, well, that was Russian forces attempt to like retake cause by some task and purpose. If you like my next one, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.